update on Nation to Nation. What's on the political watch list for 2023? Improving and indigenizing investigations into sexual assault. If we can just stay the course as best as we can, then we're going to make an impact down the road. And finally, will inherent Indigenous rights hold up in court against BC mining companies? We have a, a legal right to um, grant consent or not grant consent with full consent. Good evening and welcome to Nation to Nation. I'm your host, Lindsay Richardson. It's our first show of the new year, and while Parliament is still not in session, we thought we'd take a look into the crystal ball to see what the important issues are to watch out for in the coming months. And who knows better than Rose LeMay? She's the CEO of the Indigenous Reconciliation Group and a regular columnist with The Hill Times. She joins me from Ottawa now. Rose, welcome to the show. Oh, good evening, Lindsay, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, to start off, in your latest column for the Hill Times, you make a prediction about reconciliation will look like in 2023. Can you summarize that for us? Sure. I'm looking back at what has happened in the last couple of years and the significantly fast, faster movement in reconciliation the last couple of years, I think, is actually going to continue. This is a year that I really think that Indigenous voice and leadership will be valued not because this is a quote right thing to do for reconciliation or even to be tokenized only on Indigenous issues. I think this is a year that Canadians start to value and recognize the importance of Indigenous voice and leadership for all of us, for all Canadians. I also think that the health care urgency around the quality and effectiveness of services to all Canadians, that sense of urgency that Canadians might have for their own health care, I believe it's actually going to carry over to a demand for equitable health care services for Indigenous Canadians. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a few other predictions, but I could go on for a bit. How, let me come back to you. Does that sound um, doable? Because, boy, I really hope for this. Well, you know, we've seen they've made attempts to put this on paper, especially through Bill C-29, which promises to create a national council for reconciliation. So that is currently in the Senate and is set to become law soon. So I'm curious, can you touch on your expectations for this council? Well, I think I have high expectations. If reconciliation is to be something that we are held to account for, for departments, for, for federal departments, for provincial governments, even municipal governments, perhaps corporations as well, if we're to be held to account for it, then I believe it should be more like a human rights commission. Almost every province and territory will have a commission to give oversight and consequences around um, safe women in the workplace to ensure that there's no barriers for women. I'm concerned that we haven't gone down this route for reconciliation. If reconciliation is this important to us, then it should be stated in law and given to an organization that has fairly serious teeth in order to enforce it. At this point, mm -hmm. what is being proposed as a nonprofit does not have that, so that, that's quite concerning to me. Now, obviously, reconciliation being sort of the umbrella term here, and there are lots of issues that fall under that. So I'm going to pass Absolutely. this back to you. Is there What else is there happening on Parliament Hill in 2023 that we should be taking note of? Well, there is some discussion around First Nations policing and what that will look like in the next iteration. I think there's some issues around timing. I'm also saying there's some issues around how much is on the table. The one thing that I see when I look at First Nations policing is what an amazing model this is for all of us. It's truly a community-based policing service that has local control. And as we look at some issues around the RCMP, some issues around some other police forces across Canada, there's a lot to be learned from First Nations policing if it were adequately funded and given enough freedom to do what it does really well. Mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned policing. That was actually a great tie-in to my next question. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how do you feel the situation with Winnipeg police and the serial murders, how, as that plays out, how is that affecting the overall um, issue with distrust between Indigenous peoples and police forces across Canada? Well, I have to say it's pretty difficult for me to separate my emotional response to the situation because, quite honestly, I am horrified. I am disgusted by the Winnipeg Police lack of action. If this were the sons and daughters, and this is a horrible thing to say, but it's true, if it were kids of parliamentarians, we would never have received this answer, oh, well, too difficult, too expensive, can't search. If we think back to a similar situation, the Picton murders in Vancouver, over 180 anthropologists and a whole bunch of experts were called in and worked for years. 
That's the model that we should be looking at. There should never be a question around looking for the remains of survivors. And I, my heart goes out to the families to have to actually fight for what is a pretty simple thing that we should be doing in every single society. Yeah, and no doubt a lot of people are feeling unsettled about that decision. But as you no doubt know, earlier this week, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller appointed Jennifer Moore Rattray to advise on the creation of an ombudsperson's office. And so when that's finally up and running, how do you think it will be effective in holding government or police forces to account concerning issues with MMIWG? Well, I think the um, proverbial devil will be in the details of this. I haven't seen much on what the role of the ombudsman person or its office will hold. There are some uh, lessons learned in some other ombudsman type offices in Ottawa. It likely will have influence over the federal government. The issue is whether or not it will have uh, influence over provinces and territories. The quick question is whether it will have influence over local police forces all across the country. This is a difficult thing to enforce given the numerous jurisdictions that are happening. It would need provinces and territories to also buy in, and I suspect there might be some hesitancy on some provinces. Mm -hmm. Now another issue of interest here, something that's been discussed pretty extensively over the last year, is the phenomena of non-Indigenous people claiming Indigenous ancestry, often for career advance in, in academia. So you've written on this. Uh, why do you say we need to beware a simplistic approach when defining identity? I think it's easy for us as First Nations, and I, I suspect it may be so, but I can't speak for Inuit or Métis. I think it might be easier for us as First Nations to feel a, a pretty strong emotional response to allegations of fraud. And this really, this is an issue around fraud, around identity, around misrepresentation. And identity is actually really difficult we think it might be an easy thing to measure out and put in a box, but it turns out the identity is quite difficult. Uh, and I'm, I'm a 60 scoop survivor, and so I've really spent a lot of time trying to figure out what identity might be. Is it language? Is it being living on reserve? Is it, and there's all sorts of check boxes that we look for, and a lot of times they're correct. But for every once in a while, they're not. And so it's a, we can't really take a checkbox approach to this. It is a quite a complicated issue. My fear is that people might get caught up who are truly trying to find themselves in this, who really are First Nations or Inuit or Métis. They might get caught up in this need to out people who don't seem to be Indigenous enough. Uh, so it, it, I, I find it quite complicated. Um, and I, I do hope that we also are find a measured way to respond to and ensure that pretendians don't take the voices of indigenous people so it's it's complicated yeah. lots of political issues and lots of also individual stories and realities to account for in the coming year rose that's all mm -hmm. the time we have for today but i just wanted to thank you for getting us all up to speed on what to keep mm -hmm. eyes on in 2023 well thank you lindsay all right have a good evening now, after the break, what can police improve when it comes to investigating sexual assault among Indigenous women? Stay with us. And we're back with a shocking statistic. Research indicates that more than half of Indigenous women in Canada will experience sexual assault or abuse in their lifetime. But according to StatsCan, only 6% of survivors will make a report with police. The recent Winnipeg serial murders are forcing questions across Canada about how to foster trust between Indigenous women and police officers, as well as questions about whether police are truly proactive in these cases. The reason why the authorities don't get creative is simply because they don't care. And the only way to get them to care is to light a fire underneath their backside. So police officers in Northern Ontario are working to improve this relationship. Later this month, they'll be introducing a new trauma-informed video training module for officers handling allegations of sexual assault, which they hope will be adopted countrywide. Joining me now is Detective Sergeant Alana Morrison, who leads the Sexual Assault Support Program with the Anishinaabe Aski Police Service, serving First Nations communities across Northern Ontario. Thanks so much for making the time for us today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. 
Now, I understand this new training that's coming up is supposed to rectify some of those issues. And obviously, reporting a sexual assault is never an ideal situation. Uh, it's obviously very painful for the people involved. But from your vantage point, can you walk us through what you feel is an ideal way to proceed when a sexual assault is reported? It's my opinion and the uh, findings of the program itself is that the first initial meeting with any victim, be it Indigenous or not, um, will set the tone for the rest of the um, uh, work that you're going to do with a victim or a survivor. As in, um, if, if you uh, present to them uh, the best you can, bias-free, myth-free, um, that is best case scenario, but also giving a, uh, an indigenous, um, an indigenous uh, survivor the chance to sit and not again feel rushed or feel like they're being judged by the person that's um, interviewing them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just that initial response is gonna make a huge impact going forward all the way down. So that's that's sort of my, my take on um, the question. Yeah, and I mean, we use this term trauma-informed often enough when we're talking about changing or improving systemic procedures, be it in policing or elsewhere. But I'm curious, what does the term trauma-informed mean to you? To me, um, in, in the videos that we conducted with uh, Dr. Lori Haskell, um, I, I can't begin to tell you the stress that I had first and foremost preparing because um, being critiqued by a nationally renowned doctor um, was very stressful for me to start. Um, but once um, uh, we got into the process, um, I was able to, uh, for the lady that I interviewed, um, just give her that opportunity to talk about what she remembered in the event, not um, being bombarded with questions that would uh, try and make her feel like um, that she was in the wrong or anything, um, asking her questions like, uh, tell me what you remember. You know, tell me, um, you know, talking about uh, how a certain um, piece of what happened to her affected her, what thoughts were going through her mind, um, things like that. Uh, in, in the policing world, uh, we got so far away from, uh, in my opinion, uh, treating people uh, like they're human. I hate to say that, but it's, it's um, you know, and not, you know, it shouldn't be the color of someone's skin. It shouldn't be their social status. It should just be the fact that they were uh, traumatized um, and then given that time to rest. Um, and then, you know, just giving them time to slowly remember what they remember and how they felt as opposed to um, a quickly rushed statement, um, a statement that uh, uh, alludes to the fact that it was their fault, uh, things like that. Um, I am nowhere near a, a doctor or as knowledgeable on tra uh, trauma informed in the brain uh, as Dr. Lori Haskell, but I can say as a police officer, when you slow down, take your time and really know your case, that's when you're gonna have the best success in the court and with the, with the client. And it seems like there are a lot of obstacles even getting to that point because there is still a fundamental and widespread mistrust of police, especially among Indigenous people. I'm curious, with the situation unfolding in Winnipeg with the serial murders and the reluctance of police to uh, investigate it fully, what do you think that's doing for the overall attitude or perception of policing services in Canada? I've been following uh, what's been happening in Winnipeg, and that is a great question. Um, what is it doing? It's, it's <laughs> I hate to say this, but it, it's kind of taking away from the work that we're trying to do here, as in uh, repair relationships between police and, and trying to restore that trust from a survivor to um, about police officers that we're not all judgmental, we're all not full of myths and stereotypes, that there are a large percentage of us out here out there that actually do care and actually want to help um, so uh, what's happening in Winnipeg in my opinion is setting us back somewhat but I, I do believe that um, the women that are out there and all the advocates that are out there um, I, I just I just send so much strength to all of them to keep fighting the good fight okay.
That's good to hear. Now, the video yes. training will be available online at the end of this month. Is there anything else that people need to know? You know, I, I think I'm going to take this forum in this moment to just say that, you know, to the, all the officers out there that deal with these kinds of cases, I know they're hard and I know they're not easy and they can be very frustrating to take to a trial process for sure. But I, I think that what is going on in Canada right now as far as the uh, uh, in, um, Indian residential schools and uh, the uh, unmarked graves being located um, and MMIWG, um, I, we're in a real, I think Indigenous peoples, including myself personally, are going through a really um, uh, intense healing time right now. And I think the time is right now to introduce this trauma-informed uh, process that policing is adopting. And and I think um, if we can just stay the course as best as we can, then we're going to make an impact down the road. That's my belief. Yeah, that's very well put, Detective Sergeant Morrison. Thank you so much for your work on this and for keeping us abreast. And hopefully this is a program that will be picked up by other forces across Canada. I hope so. And uh, you know what, if there's anyone out there that needs any more information or um, wants to contact me, I'm, I'm so available. I believe in this and I believe that change is coming. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Now after the break, British Columbia adopted its own UNDRIP legislation in 2019. But how will it hold up in a courtroom? We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're moving over to the West Coast now, specifically British Columbia, where provincial legislation based on UNDRIP will face its first legal test in court. Back in 2019, British Columbia became the first jurisdiction in the world to enshrine the rights of Indigenous peoples in provincial law through its Bill 41, aiming to align BC's laws with fundamental rights outlined by the United Nations. It's high time that uh, elected representatives in our colonial institutions understood that and took steps to uh, reconcile, and that's what we've done here in BC. Coming up in April, the province's Human Rights Commissioner will be intervening in two BC Supreme Court cases, using these declarations to back up the argument that First Nations have a fundamental right to profit from mining development projects or refuse them flat out. BC's Commissioner for Human Rights, Kasari Govinder, joins me on Zoom from Vancouver now. Thank you for taking the time to discuss this development today. My pleasure. So just to start off, I'm sure people in BC are somewhat familiar with DRIPA, but for people elsewhere in Canada, it's a bit of a game mix mixing acronyms. So can you explain for us what the key differences are between the human rights outlines in UNDRIP versus DRIPA? Sure. So the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, is an international law document. So countries all agreed to, to comply with the principles that were laid out there, or, or many did, um, including Canada. So that was at the UN level. And then when within Canada, though, it is, it's, there's some question about what uh, role international law plays within Canada. And BC took the, the step to bring it into law through uh, what we call the Declaration Act or DRIPA for short. So it contains the same rights. It really says, we're gonna comply with UNDRIP. We're gonna follow what UNDRIP says at the UN level. And, and uh, as, a, as a province, we're gonna commit to doing that. Okay, now there's obviously an exciting practical application of these policies coming up. So I'd like to hear from you more about these two Supreme Court cases and the arguments that will be used or raised before a judge coming up. Absolutely. So these uh, these two cases um, involving the Gakatla Nation and the Hattasat First Nation um, involves the Mineral Tenure Act, which is the legislation um, that uh, governs uh, some some issues around mineral exploration. And this case concerns the first grant of of um, a power to to lay a claim and uh, on, on land to do some of that initial exploration and it those claims can be laid and granted without any consultation to the nations on whose land um, that claim is being made. And so this case concerns, it's called a judicial review, so the court will look at how these decisions are made and decide whether they're made in accordance uh, with the law and with certain legal principles. Uh, of, of course, the nations are arguing um, that this is contrary to their rights.
rights to have these claims go forward without them uh, being able to, uh, or necessarily being able to grant consent to the claims being granted. Now again, this is something that obviously varies from province to province. So in BC's case, can you sort of back up and tell us what the process has been up until this point? If say a mining company wants to explore or exploit, uh, you know, a site that is claimed by a First Nation? So the claims uh, are made um, under the Mineral Tenure Act without these initial claims are made uh, without any consultation and without any requirement for consultation at all with the nations on whose land um, that those initial claims are being made. This is the, uh, the challenge to that process. So this is the moment that nations are saying that needs to change, that we have a, we have a, a legal right to um, grant consent or not grant consent, withhold consent, and that that should be built into the, the law itself. And the argument, part of the argument at least, is that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, again incorporated, which has been incorporated into BC law through the Declaration Act, requires requires that level of consent. That is the, the kind of essential argument that we're here to, to talk about. Now more broadly, obviously this is the first sort of legal test of these policies or guidelines in UNDRIP and DRIPA. I'm wondering, do you see other provisions in both of those documents that could possibly be used in a legal context moving forward? I think the implications of this case are very broad. So I think the, the application could be much broader potentially and could be very groundbreaking. Um, the, the, the case uh, that the court's considering is around this issue around the Mineral Tenure Act, as I've mentioned. Um, and that's really important and our role is not to, to, take, it, to take the case beyond uh, those parameters. But I think it's, it's clear that as the first case really testing the legal significance of the Declaration Act. What, is this, what does this actually mean in law? That that will then have ripple effects to the next time uh, the, the courts are interpreting how it applies, or the next time the government's thinking about what does this mean to us that we've adopted this law, and how do we move forward now with drafting new laws and revising existing laws on our books? So I think the implications of this of this one case are significant, which is our role as an intervener is to to be here because of that, because of that broader role that the Declaration Act and under it plays in decolonization and reconciliation in our province. Now, I guess it's just one last wrap up question. I'm curious, why do you feel the lack of consultation or compensation in these development projects is a human rights issue versus a political issue? Um, you know, UNDRIP and the Declaration Act are human rights instruments. They are they are instruments to protect indigenous rights, to protect their most fundamental rights. And one of the distinct pieces that applies to an indigenous rights framework that doesn't apply necessarily in the same way to all human rights is that connection to the land, is human rights in relation to the land base uh, that indigenous people have had taken away from them. So I think uh, consent to, to develop on land is a key component of the human rights landscape for Indigenous peoples. Perfect. I think that's the perfect point to wrap up on. Thank you so much for your time today, and we'll definitely be monitoring this issue as it moves forward through the courts. Thank you. That's all we have for this week on Nation to Nation. And if you missed any part of tonight's show, don't fret because you can check out our website at aptnnews.ca or our podcasts at aptnnews.ca slash podcasts. I'm your host, Lindsay Richardson, and thank you again for joining us on this first episode of 2023. Until next time.